Uh, so, uh, Congressman Petra and Congressman Hartel, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, we have lots of questions, and uh, <clears throat> we are shocked every day by the news that we're, we're hearing from the United States. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, sort of we were enjoying as sort of like a political entertainment about the rise of uh, Mr. Trump. But nowadays, uh, it's no longer a joke, I would say. And it's even become a geopolitical threat to Japan, to a certain degree, about the way he talks about the alliance uh, and his view, views of the world are very sort of difficult for us to understand. So today, I, I uh, prepared some questions, and I've uh, shown this to you beforehand. And uh, we can sort of start a conversation dialogue according to that, that question. So the, uh, uh, anything you want to say beforehand going into this conversation? Just, yes, just yes, please. Briefly, I, I just want to thank um, so much uh, our executive uh, director. Oh, it's high. It's high. I just wanted to thank uh, the executive director, uh, uh, Jinko Chano, so much for um, uh, having us here and for SPF and all that uh, all that's been done with the Foreign Members Association. We have over 500 uh, former senators and congressmen, and uh, this partnership uh, uh, and your sponsoring us has been uh, so um, educational for our members of Congress. We're able to bring uh, seven members over last month that have a continuing program with lunches and dinners in the U.S. Capitol building uh, with a great turnout of 20, 30 senators at a time talking about uh, current issues. And it's all because of your help and your sponsorship, and we thank you so very, very much. And we're so happy to be here. This is my first visit to Japan, and I've learned such a great deal and had so many gracious uh, people helping me that I just can't thank you enough. Yeah, and I, I would like to echo the, the thanks to the South Kakao Foundation for sponsoring this and for working with the uh, four members of Congress organization and in, in supporting the dialogue between members of the Diet and the American Congress. And I would like to also just to kind of put the discussion to follow in context, because I think it's important to do this. I was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1979. I'd uh, never been to Japan. I'd thought I'd served before in the Peace Corps in Africa, so I, I was interested in international affairs. But uh, after I was elected, senior members of both political parties, Tom Foley and a fellow named Bill Frenzel at the time, uh, called me aside and said if I had the opportunity, they would very much appreciate it if I would be as active as I could in participating in exchanges between the members of the House of Representatives and the uh, uh, Japanese Diet and, and other of these cultural exchanges because uh, they felt this was something that required a, a lot of work and interest on the part of individual members of Congress. And I've done that, that since uh, for, and had visited Japan uh, well over a dozen times, maybe two dozen times, uh, and I still remember meeting with uh, uh, many of those uh, times with Tom Foley when he was in, the leader in the in the other party, but in our in our uh, as Speaker of our House and Chairman before that of our Agriculture Committee, working uh, with Japanese uh, uh, agricultural interests. And I remember very strongly uh, Mr. Mansfield when he was um, uh, ambassador here, uh, meeting with Americans and saying the United States-Japan relationship is the most important relationship in the world, bar none. And he would pound on the table. And it always made an impression on me. Uh, and I think it still is, not just to the United States or to Japan, but to uh, for stability in the most populous part of the world. So. Uh, it's important that we have discussions. We're going to have differing perspectives on different things. And I, I suspect that there are things that happen in Japan that Americans find strange. And there are certainly things in the United States that uh, people in Japan and other places in the world are finding strange. Uh, we'll do our best to, 
not necessarily uh, excuse everything that goes on, but attempt to put it in some context or explain it. And I, I'm happy that, uh, to have this opportunity. Well, thank you, Congressman, uh, very much for supporting U.S.-Japan relationship uh, from, for your side. Uh, but that doesn't stop me from asking you hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> okay, so the uh, first question uh, sort of that, I, that I prepared is that, you know, we, we're always being told, like just you said, that Japan is an, the, the most important partner to the U.S. Uh, however, in these election processes, we almost never hear about Japan except for Mr. Trump criticizing us for stealing jobs from the U.S., you know, lumping Japan together with Mexico and China. And this seemed to sort of resonate uh, among Trump supporters and opposition to the uh, TPP on the Democratic side, you know, though not mentioning Japan directly, seems to indicate that many feel that countries such as Japan uh, could steal away jobs from the U.S. And adding to this, Mr. Trump sees Japan as a free rider in terms of um, U.S.-Japan mutual security alliance. So is this kind of view widely shared, and do they resonate among some sort of sectors in the, in the U.S.? Uh, yes, they do. That's why he's where he is in the polls today. Uh, and he's not the first one to tap into that sentiment. Uh, there has been, uh, in the United States, uh, really probably since World War II, World War I, during the Depression, and then more recently as we've, we've seen uh, automation come in and people lose, lose jobs and having to gain more skills in order to keep jobs, uh, a growing uh, portion of uh, people in both political parties who felt disenfranchised or discontented and, and have, uh, I think it's been a convenient scapegoat to blame foreign co competition for some of these changes when in fact they're due to a variety of factors, that being only one and probably not the, not, not the most important one. In, in this election, if you analyze the polls uh, closely, uh, I think uh, so far we've had something in the neighborhood of uh, a dozen or two, uh, 18 prim some primaries and uh, Mr. Trump has secured a little less than 50% in two small states. Normally, is it in the neighborhood of uh, 20 to 35% of the vote? Uh, that translates into probably the support overall of 10 to 15% of the American electorate. Uh, a lot of people have been switching over from the Democratic Party or from outside the political process and voting in the Republican primary, and I think it's in reaction to Trump largely, uh, and uh, the turnout on the Republican side has been about double that on the Democratic side so far. Uh, these people have not had a uh, spokesman before that has gained the kind of media attention that Trump has been able to, to do, and that's been a, a major factor in his, uh, uh, in his support. But it's not as though he's representing the basic uh, Republican Party, let alone the Democratic Party. And in fact, many of the party leaders from uh, Mitt Romney to uh, Paul Ryan to some extent and others have been speaking out quite strongly on some of the things that uh, Mr. Trump have, uh, has said and disassociating themselves from the, his approach to uh, uh, campaigning. Uh, the, the thing is, though, that when people do have discontents and uh, are unhappy, uh, the issue is whether you vent it or you try to continue to suppress it. And uh, in the big picture, over time, it's probably healthier to vent it and let people take a look at it and then analyze it and make adjustments as they're necessary to try to deal with the underlying problems in a constructive way rather than pretending they don't exist and sweeping them under the uh, carpet. Uh, and that, that's the constructive side of this whole thing. It's not a pretty picture, but one of my favorite quotes in politics is Winston Churchill who said, the worst form of government ever conceived by the mind of man is democracy except for all the rest. And this is an illustration of that, of the truth of that statement. Well, I think, I think Churchill also said that the American people try everything 
um, but in the end, they finally do the right thing. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, I think we're, all other possibilities. we've seen that before. <laughs> I've been involved in politics, too, uh, since the 70s, 1972. My uh, older brother, I ran his campaign for county commissioner against a 25-year veteran, and he won. And in that race in November, we saw this terrible reaction against busing as far as integration of our schools uh, with, with fistfights and violence and all the rest. And we saw... Uh, we saw the George Wallace campaign, uh, where he was winning primaries in Michigan and Maryland, Democratic primaries in that case, um, with uh, his uh, trying to stop black students from integrating uh, our public schools. And, and so we've seen this, and before that, before we were even born, Huey Long from Louisiana challenging Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, uh, as a demagogue. So we've seen this before in American politics. And, you know, even on a good day with American elections uh, that we've seen before, nothing ever educational ever comes out of an American election. We have these 30 and 60 second uh, television commercials. 90% of the uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, raised in political campaigns, 90% of that money goes to these 60 second television commercials, which aren't going to be able to cover any kind of fact, nor do they try to cover any kind of a factual situation whatsoever, but to bring emotion into it. So we've seen this all before. It's just that uh, in our lifetime, we haven't seen anything as low on a daily basis as the Trump campaign, and, uh, and he is a candidate. And so the American people, uh, I, think, uh, I think a majority, are offended by uh, uh, Trump and what he, uh, what he says on a regular basis. And uh, his main targets have been, uh, as far as foreign uh, targets, have been Mexico and, and China. Uh, I'm from Detroit, and you know we've had our greatest uh, car sales in the United States in history right now. And so we're thriving that way, and I think more Americans actually realize that uh, Japanese companies employ a lot of Americans, and uh, that you know there's a difference from the, the 70s and 80s when we were in the doldrums and when we were having uh, problems with American car sales uh, and, uh, and employment uh, at our plants. Uh, now we've turned the corner, uh, as you've seen in the last decade, uh, from uh, the companies almost going bankrupt and going under as far as uh, Ford, or as far as GM and Chrysler and Ford would have been damaged by that too. Uh, so I think we come at it really, uh, while there's controversies about uh, our treaties in all respects and about future treaties, I think we come out of it uh, from a stronger uh, position to have uh, uh, a better uh, factual economic talk about it. And I think people are uh, not learning anything from the campaign, but have residual knowledge and knowledge from other sources uh, that I think is, uh, is helpful. Uh, I think the problem with the, the Trump phenomena is that it angers uh, all of us that uh, he's allowed on a daily basis uh, to have this platform and to gain a great number of uh, votes and support. Um, again, he won in Michigan last week uh, in the primary. I'm afraid he's going to do well uh, in this Tuesday election uh, of uh, these major states coming up now. But he has not had a majority even of Republicans yet, let alone a majority of uh, overall voters. And so uh, uh, we've seen minority candidates before that have been strong and they've been loud and obnoxious. Uh, he might be the loudest and most obnoxious. It doesn't mean he's going to have more uh, support in the end. Uh, when <clears throat> we talk to you know think tankers in Washington, uh, policy makers, and we, when, whenever, we, whenever we talk to them up with them about the alliance, we feel comfortable. We feel good because they all cherish the alliance. They know how sort of alliance function in, in this region. But as I said in my first question. Uh, Mr. Trump criticizes you know, Japan as being a free rider. So how is U.S.-Japan alliance sort of perceived among the ordinary people? I'm sure people understand that you have alliance with NATO, and you're part of it. But what about this perception of this alliance that we have among the, the ordinary people, not the think tankers, not the well-educated, and if you have any sort of sense of that, uh, I would, uh, we would very much appreciate it. Well, I'd just say that uh, I've had uh, uh, former Japanese ambassadors to the United States, Ichiro Fujisaki being the most recent one, to come out to my district and talk to high school students. And actually, in a couple of little cities, uh, Manitowoc and Nina, uh, Wisconsin, uh, speak to students who are studying Japanese. Uh, and uh, we have sister city relationships. Uh, we do an enormous amount of 
uh, agricultural trade. Uh, uh, when you visit factories in my district in the fall, they're canning vegetables and so on, and the labels are in Japanese. Uh, and people are very aware of that, and they know as they're working in those factories that their jobs depend on the uh, Japanese consumer. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, despite the frustration, uh, it's, it, there is a strong underlying uh, uh, affection and appreciation of the importance of the relationship. And I've never had any difficulty as a representative going around uh, uh, setting up meetings or working local officials have been more than delighted to help uh, do this. The local businesses are very happy to, to participate. So uh, you, in a town meeting, we, we have town meetings, anyone can come. And you will always get a few people who are, as you see at the extreme with Mr. Trump's meetings, where people will be organized to come and cause disruption on one side or another uh, and argue at the meeting. Uh, but this is part of uh, certainly uh, venting, as I said before, the frustration that people have. And, and you will get people who are uh, ignorant and who will say un unpleasant things. Uh, my own ancestors, my grandparents, came to the United States from Norway and my grandmother couldn't speak English very well, but she could understand it pretty well. And she, as I was a little boy growing up, she would say, she'd go to the grocery store and people would make rude comments about dumb, ignorant foreigners and this sort of thing, and it hurt her a great deal. But most, 80%, more than 90, 95% of the American people understand that, and that, that they've had this shared experience. And, and everyone, I think people in Japan know if they've had relatives or children who've been exchange students in the United States or have visited the United States, that the average uh, experience is one of people going out of their way to attempt to be friendly and, and uh, 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 explain the, understand the importance of our getting along together. Yeah, Professor, I'm glad you focused us on, uh, on that question. I think that, um, you know, who's ever elected president, we have uh, 100 members of the Senate, 435 in the Senate. We have our three branches of government. They have the checks and balances. And the Congress is independent of the president, even if it's a president from, elected from their own party. And you've seen that many times. And so the Senate has uh, the approval of all uh, trade agreements and, uh, and treaties and, uh, and alliances and all the rest. So that can't be changed overnight by anyone. And unlike our uh, fast shooting uh, from the hip uh, in the elections, our press process of our government is designed to be as slow as possible and as deliberate as possible uh, so that we do have a chance to look at all the facts and, uh, and educate members because over 60% of our Congress is new in the last six years in the House and the Senate. And I think that's something that's not always realized uh, even in our country but uh, also around the world. And you know, one of the reasons uh, that the SPF program is so important is that, uh, uh, and I can say it as uh, a former member of Congress, and uh, Tom and I, uh, our states, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, border Canada, we've had uh, the Prime Minister uh, Trudeau uh, here this last week. It was a great celebration, a great visit. But the fact is that our, our people in America, with our closest neighbor, uh, don't know that much about Canada, and they couldn't tell you the population about it, and, and they couldn't tell you the government and the cabinet of Canada. And, and that's not true just of the American public. That's true of members of Congress uh, also. Uh, certainly the people that are uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee and on uh, the Armed Services Committee uh, pay more attention and are, are much more uh, up to date on the specifics of our alliance and alliances around the world. Uh, but the average American, the average member of Congress, knows more about NATO, for instance. And, uh, and they don't know specifics enough. And now we have so many new members of Congress, there's uh, really more uh, need to educate the people. When I talk to people here in Japan, they know far more about our political system and our election right now than if I went to a similar audience in the United States. And I could tell by the professor's questions, but I could tell by the questions you're writing and by the conversations that we've had. And so it's a very necessary thing to, uh, to have uh, as much contact and as much education uh, about uh, all the different issues that we have. 
I think that the American people uh, have always had and, and do have a great friendship for the Japanese people and are uh, fully supportive of our treaty and, uh, and our trade agreements. And the problem is they don't know exactly what close trading partners we are. Uh, you know, the SPF and other organizations here put out uh, information of uh, Japan being one of our most important trading partners, uh, second, third, and fourth in so many different categories, and how important that is not just uh, for those facts, but jobs in America, and how important that is to American voters now and in the future. And so, you know, the more education we can do, the more contact, I, I think it's really true. And sometimes as a byproduct of an election, we realize uh, how much more effort we should be making in those areas. I think this election is a very, very good example uh, of that. So I'm, I'm not concerned because I think the record is very clear and I think we have many, uh, many strong voices and when we see that uh, we've had such great contact before with uh, Ambassador Foley and Ambassador Mansfield from the Congress, we have a tradition of congressional leadership being close to the leadership uh, here in your country, and that uh, I think that serves both countries very well. Well, thank you. Here in Japan, I guess we were a bit disappointed that uh, nowhere, no one in the U.S. is seriously countering uh, uh, Mr. Trump's message that Japan is stealing jobs away from, from the U.S. In fact, we are a job creator in the United States. So I hope you would sort of send out that message, you know, countering Trump and, and and you know, Japan is, is, is in fact creating jobs in Japan. So, well, and uh, this, this question might be uh, uh, directed towards uh, uh, Congressman Petri, but uh, it's, it's, it's about Mr. Trump again. No, I, I promise this will be the last. Uh, if you know, Mr. Trump becomes the candidate, or, or for that matter, a president, uh, what should a responsible Republican uh, some have said that it will be a, you know, a crisis of the republic, therefore you should not be supporting Mr. Trump. But then again, you should be serving not for the Mr. Trump himself, but for the country and try to help Mr. Trump. How, how would you advise a sort of a young a Republican who's thinking about entering the Trump administration or not and if you have any views on that, uh, well, I'd appreciate I appreciate it. I, I would, what I could say, tell you is that the ones I know who are in elected office now who are Republicans are terrified of running on a Trump ticket, leaving aside the, uh, uh, all the, the uh, smoke and, and controversy, the polls that they take indicate that there will be a lot of Republican traditional Republican voters who will either not vote for uh, Trump and vote for the Democratic candidate or who will stay home. And their fear is that, of course, if the, their uh, people who are inclined to vote for them don't turn up and vote because of Trump, it could affect the whole ticket. Uh, this has happened before when uh, Senator Goldwater was nominated as a Republican candidate. Uh, there was a huge landslide on the, uh, of elected, people who never expected to be elected were elected as Democrats up and down the ticket for county courthouse and for, for state legislatures and so on because uh, probably a third of the Republicans uh, stayed home uh, uh, and wouldn't vote in the election. Uh, the, uh, uh, so this, is, this could be, a, uh, if this were to come to pass, a, a realigning election, but each political party is actually a coalition of different, it's a two-party system, but there are many different views than just two, two a, on most issues. A possibility of a third party? Senator Ben Sass is talking about this. Well, do, do you see a possibility? I don't, I, it could be a third party, but it wouldn't win. It would only make it, uh, uh, I mean, from, that's why I think uh, you saw Michael Bloomberg was seriously thinking of running for president. And finally, after looking at all, and, and he has a big ego, and he wants to, he loves America, and he wants to make a contribution, but he thought that if he were to run, it would more likely uh, 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 elect, uh, encourage uh, a Trump candidacy, who, and he didn't agree with uh, most of Trump's views such as they are. 
Yeah, I agree with Tom that you know Bloomberg is a patriot. He realized that it might uh, split the Democratic vote uh, uh, because he uh, is, is supportive on so many issues in agreement with the Democrats. And so uh, Mr. Bloomberg uh, is not going to run for that reason. There might be another party. Uh, we saw it cost an election of uh, uh, George Bush Sr. when he lost to Clinton with the third with Perot in because uh, Bill Clinton never got uh, more than 48 percent in either uh, of his elections for president and uh, we saw it with Gore and uh, and Bush with Nader in the race so it can be a spoiler but third parties in our country are always absorbed and they never last and they uh, the high mark watermark really was Perot I guess with 20 uh, percent uh, twice uh, but but still uh, they they never last in our country I think uh, what we see, though, in the Trump campaign about Republican support is what I was saying about the House and the Senate. So all this time that he's been in, all the money that he's spent, all the polls and, uh, and primary elections that he's won, he still only, as of yesterday, has three congressmen uh, who've endorsed him and one, uh, one Republican senator. Uh, so there's no groundswell. In fact, it's just the opposite. Uh, the members of the Republican Party and the establishment are, are coming out stronger uh, against him, and uh, Governor Kasich and... Uh, and Rubio uh, have been talking more and more about uh, the, the bad uh, uh, behavior at his rallies and the way he uh, follows up on that that's detrimental to our political system uh, in our nation. And the real worry, I think, is more, he's still not that likely to get the Republican nomination. And, they, and as you know, they, an effort was made and he signed a pledge along with the other candidates, that they would support whoever was the nominee of the Republican Party. But I think the real one real worry is that he uh, might decide for one reason or another that that pledge is no longer valid and run as a third party candidate, which would, uh, I think, probably guarantee the Democratic uh, candidate uh, and, and uh, 12 years of Democratic government, which most Republicans are not in favor of. Uh, Congressman Hartel, uh, you mentioned about Governor George Wallace. And at the time, Democrats sort of successfully marginalized him. He, he was sort of pushed out from the party. Right? But this time around, Republicans, although there are voices within the party who's not comfortable with, with, with Mr. Trump, Republicans are not sort of able to do that. What, what is the difference? Uh, is it the political environment? Uh, what is it? Why was Democrats then able to marginalize George Wallace, although he lost the election, uh, but this time around, Republicans cannot do that, it seems like, up until now. Well, I, I will be partisan um, a bit because it, it is different. You're right, Professor. The Democrats had marginalized and, and disavowed George Wallace, but he was still... Uh, running in our Democratic primaries, and he was winning in, uh, in many northern states until he was shot and wounded. And so, you know, we don't forget that, uh, that, that there's a lot of anger out there and, uh, and emotion and a lot of misdirected uh, uh, politics and thinking uh, in, 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 in many ways uh, in our country. And I think, you know, it's important to speak out against that. Uh, and, and I think I'll be partisan to say that as a Democrat uh, from Detroit that I, I disappointed in uh, Republicans not realizing uh, this Trump factor earlier, and, and some people have laid the groundwork for it before uh, by talking irresponsibly about, uh, about immigration and uh, trade and other issues. Uh, you know, there, there's, you can talk about things in a partisan way, and you can certainly uh, differ uh, about public issues. Uh, but there's no reason to bring uh, emotion and misdirection and uh, uh, altered facts into the situation. And we've seen that too often in the past. And we've seen people try to play to fear and, and play to danger, and they're going to protect them and everything else. You know, this... this uh, I think uh, that uh, one of the most uh, serious threats that we face is uh, what's going on in North Korea uh, in, in these recent years and in recent days. Uh, uh, yet people, you know, in the presidential campaign are talking about ISIS as if uh, that was, you know, a threat to our nation uh, this afternoon. Uh, but they, 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 they play on the emotions of, of some of the issues. Uh, to such a degree and get people all uh, all worked up. And so we've seen that before in, uh, in uh, jingoistic and uh, discriminatory ways, and uh, 
I think people have to speak out against that. I, I do have faith, though, that there will be Republican leaders speaking out against that. I think Governor Kasich and others are going to be very assertive. And I give, uh, I give Mitt Romney a lot of credit for speaking out uh, two weeks ago. I think it took a lot of guts for him, and I think he was as hard-hitting and as direct as anyone could be. I just wish that uh, this, this all would have been done sooner, but uh, better now than later. I just add one or two other things. Uh, unlike Wallace, Trump has had a few more arrows in his quiver. Uh, he has self-funded his campaign, and there's been a lot of concern in our country about uh, uh, wealthy people funding and buying elections and, and funding campaigns. And you see that on the Democratic side with the Bernie Sanders uh, being funded by small contri contributions. Uh, he's He's... Uh, said a lot of controversial things, many of which were not politically correct, and there's been that struck a chord because people felt that there were there was sort of a silent censorship in some areas, and and that uh, uh, they couldn't criticize even though they felt offended themselves, uh, but uh, uh, they couldn't criticize others who were offending them. They could only have to take it, and and he has criticized the media. And uh, there have been media's changed. It's gotten uh, no, it's no longer mass media. So that people have, are able to uh, answer back through the internet and other ways. And there's been a media revolution going on. And and he's he's uh, he ma managed to ride part of that wave. Yeah, I think. But Trump, you know, it did, didn't come on the stage last week. He uh, came out against our our president Obama uh, with his birther movement years ago, four years ago, and, you know, went on and Could on. Could you explain a bit about the birther movement? <laughs> well, Maybe you know, he was, he know. was on a daily basis questioning whether President Obama was born in the United States, born in Hawaii, talking about it being a plot uh, 45 years ago, uh, and that he was born in Kenya or some place, and just, you know, made up uh, fantasy stuff that he had investigators out there, and he, he did this on a daily basis, but it really was a hate campaign. He questioned uh, the president's record regarding uh, his studies at Harvard. He, he questioned him using a teleprompter all the time. It was just absurd uh, and angry and hateful. And, you know, so it's not something, and, and you know, it, 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 at that point, as Trump reminded us uh, two weeks ago, uh, Mitt Romney asked for his endorsement, you know, in the midst of all of this, you know. So you can't have it both ways, you know. You, you can't encourage someone like that, let them in the fold, ask for their endorsement, uh, saying, oh, that's all right. You want to talk about the black president that way, as if he's not an American? Uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll allow that. Just come in and, and be one of us as a Republican and, and help us in our campaign, you know, against the president. No, we, we, we can't have that kind of uh, distortion and hatred uh, recognized uh, by political leaders. And, and so I think this is a lesson for us and for both political parties, you know, not to play with the people that, uh, that want to fan the flames of hatred uh, uh, and distortion and lies uh, about issues. We have enough serious issues to deal with already without, uh, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, crazy uh, hatred. And, you know, it's a shame that it gets airtime in our country. And it's a shame that our news media lets uh, Trump call into all these television shows and talk for 20 minutes anytime he wants to uh, and, and, and not question him about uh, the birther issue that he, that he spent so much time on before and why did he do that and, uh, and whether he's a racist, in fact. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's time to ask some of these hard questions to somebody who's running for president in our country, going out there and getting votes and to remind the public of the total person, not just uh, the, the position that he presents today. Uh, now, on the uh, Democratic side, if there were no Mr. Trump, I mean, we would be talking about Mr. Sanders, I guess, all the time. And in terms of uh, policy, Senator Sanders seemed much more radical than Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump is Mr. No Policy, or some have dubbed him a post-policy candidate. Uh, why was it possible for someone calling himself a democratic socialist to rise among the democratic support base? Does this indicate something you know, bigger than just Senator Sanders' uh, uh, his campaign doing well? And I sense that the winner of the democratic primary would be Sanders, though she may be wearing a pantsuit. So I think he has pulled the party to the left. So. What, what, what is this about, Mr. Sanders? And especially the young people 
who's sort of fascinated about a democratic socialist. It's, it's very difficult for, uh, uh, you know, for, for us to understand. So could you sort of elaborate on that? Well, it's been said this evening, no one saw that Mr. Sanders was going to win in Michigan uh, just a week ago. I was there, and, and uh, all the polls showed that uh, Hillary Clinton was far ahead, uh, except one small poll, Michigan State University poll, that, that showed that Sanders is moving up to catch her the last days. And uh, so it was, a, it was a real shock. And 80% um, of the young people, the millennials as they call them, uh, uh, voted for uh, Bernie Sanders. Okay. Now, I like Bernie Sanders, and I know him, and I, I, he's an honest person and straightforward, and he believes uh, his principles very, very strongly and has for years. And we all know where he stands. Um, but in the House and in the Senate, he was kind of regarded as a gadfly. And, what he, and he was an independent and a socialist, never called himself a Democrat until he got into this race, never ran as a Democrat in his life, never called himself a Democrat until he got in this race for president this year. So... Um, earlier last year. So, uh, you know, that does show that, uh, that it's, it's uh, overwhelming surprise, as you say, that, uh, that he would be uh, doing so well in the primaries. Uh, I think uh, in this election now, it'll be clear that, uh, that Hillary would be doing very well if she wins Illinois and Ohio and, and, and Florida. Uh, the question might be if there's a surprise in Ohio at all, because that would be, uh, you know, right below my state of Michigan and uh, with some similar issues and concerns and demographics, and uh, then that would that would mean uh, problems for uh, for Hillary going forward. If, on the other hand, she can capture these big states and continue to run up her delegate strength uh, in numbers, and also continue to uh, have such a great uh, lead with uh, the super delegates we have in the Democratic Party, which are largely members of Congress and other elected officials, uh, that she'll be able to go into the. Uh, the convention strong, but the professor's right when he says, you know, that well, she'd be wearing a pantsuit and and have more of his issues. She certainly changed quite a bit on the issues, and uh, and I think uh, evolving on those issues. But clearly, people in America are, are very very concerned uh, and and unhappy, uh, mainly with the economy, but they're questioning everything. And and Tom and I have talked about it. it you know, when I was born in 1948, and ever since in my lifetime, even as a child, I saw them talking about automation, that people would be displaced from their jobs by machines. And we've seen, you know, them with evolving to computers and, and robotics, and, and we've lost over 2 million jobs in the Midwest uh, in manufacturing. And all through my life as I've seen this happen, there hasn't been any answer or response of either political party, and that's true today. You know, that we haven't had any planning and all the rest. Uh, I, I, we learn a lot here about uh, how you have planned uh, regarding your economy and jobs in the future for young people. I've seen in Germany where they, you know, have people in the high schools trained so that when they graduate, they're already trained with the staff and equipment. Uh, they go to work at Mercedes-Benz the next day after they graduate. You know, we don't do those things in, in the United States. We have not reacted uh, uh, with programs uh, and, and policies to assist what we've uh, seen happening uh, my entire life. The last time we had this kind of back and forth between Republicans and Democrats with a close margin was after uh, uh, World War II when we had so many people returning home. We had economic dislocation as far as housing and automobiles and jobs and, and uh, you know, so many, so many different problems. But in this case, we've saw, seen it coming and both political parties are, are you know, uh, I think without uh, new ideas. Uh, I always say the Republicans have not had a new idea since Ronald Reagan said, let's increase defense vastly, let's cut taxes, and that'll solve the deficit problem, and we'll move ahead with a strong economy. Democrats haven't had a new idea since Lyndon Johnson. We just defend the old ideas, you know, in the old programs, and we don't want them touched. And I, and I think that, uh, that the nation now, and especially the young people, are saying, well, wait a minute, it's not working. We have a new world, and we're not adopting to a new world and to the problems of a new world. And so I think it is important that this is a transitional election and that uh, we're seeing more people vote, we're seeing new people vote, and I think that's health healthy for our democracy is, uh, as difficult uh, and as tumultuous as it might be. I, I think uh, myself that Bernie Sanders' success is a measure of Hillary Clinton's weakness as a candidate. 
Uh, and if you look at it, uh, Barack Obama was in somewhat the same position as uh, he, uh, when he was running as a freshman outsider's senator without much experience. Uh, but uh, uh, he had, in addition to that, a lot of support because people thought it was a good thing for our country to be uniting to have a qualified black president. And, and of course, you have a, also a significant uh, black population in the United States. And you add that to it, and, and he ended up getting the nomination. Uh, Bernie Sanders is, is getting an enormous amount of uh, financial support in contributions of twenty, thirty dollars. Millions of people are giving money to it mm -hmm. because they don't like the idea that the super PACs and a few big people. I think they were shocked to discover that Mrs. Clinton had raised, or her husband, and two, a few years after leaving office, had two billion dollars in their foundation. Mm -hmm. Where did this all come from? And this seemed like something that uh, is not been thoroughly vetted and, and, and uh, is hard to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this has left, I think, a feel, great feeling of uneasiness mm -hmm. among people who are, are, think of themselves as, as being uh, you know, average people who want someone to represent them, not basically deliver their vote to Wall Street, as Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. keeps saying. Mm -hmm. But the irony is that among the Western democracies, U.S. economy is doing quite well uh, in terms of recovering from the uh, you know, economic shock in the uh, late 2000s. U U.S. has sort of recovered quite successfully if you compared to Japan. So what's the frustration there? And, uh, you know. Well, I agree with you, Professor. Uh, we have the lowest interest rates, about 3.9 in my lifetime. We've had uh, employment go from the beginning of the Obama administration from 14, 15% down to 4.9 unemployment. We have uh, the stock market doing very well. Yesterday at uh, the highest day of the year again. Uh, home sales are up. Car sales are the best they've been in history. Um, I don't know. We have uh, less crime in our nation today. Uh, uh, the deficit's been reduced by a third as employment uh, went uh, up and jobs and all the rest. But, you know, sometimes uh, politics and economics don't uh, coincide uh, uh, with, with the facts. It's more how people feel and the perception. And I think the perception is that people and corporations are not willing to make investments now and go forward that they're worried about some other shoe to drop or whatever, that there's not the confidence that people need uh, in our economy, even though we have low energy uh, prices, uh, and we have so many things in our favor, but, uh, and we have peace in the world largely, certainly uh, more than at other times in our, in our past histories, uh, and, and yet uh, there's not that kind of confidence that we need. And I think, uh, I think it's because people haven't seen an advancement in their own life. You know, the people, and my children, for instance, they'd all like, you know, to get better paying jobs and, uh, and for the jobs to, uh, to have more security and, uh, and for the economy to be stronger and all the rest. And they, and they really don't see that happening right now on the ground. And I think that, uh, therefore, you know, the young people have made great sacrifices. They have these huge college loans, for instance, and they're not able to get a job. You go to Enterprise Car Rental, you've got people with college degrees that are, are bringing your car up, you know. Uh, so I think it's a stagnation that, uh, uh, that we have to have some other policies. Now, in the past, you know, we've tried things for having first-time buyers. We've had the GI Bill. We've had different things that stimulate the economy especially by helping uh, young people buy their first house or their first car and all different things of that sort and helping them more with the cost of their education rather than having it go sky high. So I think we need some new solutions, some new policies from both political parties. I'd make one point, and that is that an awful lot of people are being left out with the modern uh, uh, internet uh, high-tech age. I visit, my, the district I represented was of the 435 congressional districts, number one or number two, with a percentage of people with jobs in manufacturing, mm -hmm. despite it being a rural area. Mm -hmm. I would visit factories all the time, and there were factories that were trying to hire people and at the same time uh, laying people off mm -hmm. because they were installing equipment 
that needed people to have some uh, uh, numeracy and skills that so they could operate the machinery and manage the processes, and they would offer to retrain people, and so they could do this, and some people just felt they couldn't do it or, or were insecure about it or whatever, and so they would, would leave, the, leave the job, and, and they have had and still do have trouble finding uh, people and training people to fill many of these types of jobs, and they're good, high-paying jobs, but they require different skills. People are no longer just uh, doing mechanical work. They're having to, to uh, manage a uh, greater responsibility in the workplace uh, for for the uh, uh, new new age, and this is something that's been very uneasy and unsettling for a lot of people who are not that uh, oriented toward uh, the education process. Now, uh, <clears throat> we we know that foreign policy matters doesn't sort of is is not a huge issue in these pres presidential elections, except for like 2004 when the war on Iraq was going on. What about this cycle? Do you see any uh, major foreign policy issues uh, having influence uh, you know, uh, in, in this election? Or this is not, you don't see this as a foreign policy election? How, how, how do you see that? I don't, I don't really see it as a, a foreign policy issue. I, as always, we have to educate our people about uh, foreign policy. Our people think that we spend 10, 20, 25, 30 percent on foreign aid. We spend less than one percent uh, of our uh, of our budget on on foreign aid. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, there are a lot of people clamoring that uh, we go to war in the Middle East, but President Obama has been very reluctant because you know what we've done in Iraq and uh, what we did in Afghanistan has been a failure. It hasn't worked at all, with all of the all of the six trillion dollars spent and. Uh, and most importantly, all the lives lost, uh, we haven't accomplished uh, anything. In fact, the situation uh, in Iraq, at least, is, uh, is uh, worse than it was uh, before the war. So um, I think that uh, while there's a lot of clamoring about uh, foreign policy issues, uh, the Congress is not ready to address them either. You know, they have the ability to pass uh, under our Constitution their war powers uh, Amendment. They have uh, established uh, by statute that they can do a war powers resolution. And yet regarding Syria and ISIS and all the things that people make speeches about, uh, they've, they have yet to move on a resolution uh, at all uh, in that regard. I think personally the President's been right in being reluctant to use American force again because he sees that it's not going to be, uh, not going to be a solution. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, that we've got to start thinking with our heads, you know, rather than uh, uh, having people just with their emotions uh, regarding foreign policy. And, uh, uh, and so I'm glad that uh, what we have in the election process is just rhetoric, but nobody's proposing any policies or going to war. Very few people, the ones who talked about sending American troops over to uh, fight ISIS tomorrow afternoon, they're all out of the race. They've already lost the primaries on the Republican side. No, I'm not sure. I think it's uh, the American public supports the military and they want to have a strong military. They think it's important for our country and for the world. Uh, they are very unsettled about uh, the threat of terrorism and we could just be one more terrorist attack even inside the United States into making that a bigger issue. Uh, immigration is a foreign policy issue in a sense as part of a nation controlling its borders and how to do it. And, and this is, is certainly an issue in this campaign, uh, although it's not, I, don't, I think it's, it's not going to be an issue in the campaign only because people who are arguing for trying to fix our bro broken immigration system uh, have given up uh, trying to make a case. Uh, several of the Republicans did going into the primary process and, and a number of the Democratic candidates as well. There were strong efforts in the Congress by members in both parties, including our current <coughs> Republican speaker, to work across the aisle to try to come up with a series of reforms in the immigration system, and those have, those have broken down. Uh, so that that is an issue, but it's it's not one that uh, progress is likely to be made on in this election. Although Mr. 
Trump talks about making America strong again. I think his image of the United States is like fortress America, you know, symbolized in you know, building the wall and all that. And you see Mr. Sand Senator Sanders not you know, being very much interested in foreign policy. And those two messages are resonating among the grassroots, at least. So do you see a sort of a, a sense of retrenchment sort of rising among the people? You've been in war since 2001, continuously. And we totally understand that people would get tired of it. So what's, what's the sense of the psyche of the American people about sort of you know, uh, active internationalism and engaging the world? And is it still there? I mean, can we rely on the U.S.? It's, it's, it's not an academic question for, for Japan because we need U.S. involved in this region because you are functionally part of this region. Well, I was a member of the Armed Services Committee for 12 years, and I chaired the Oversight uh, Investigation Subcommittee, and I get so angry when I hear Mr. Trump say that our, our American uh, armed services are so weak now and that Obama weakened them. You know, Obama actually, the president, uh, Obama, has actually strengthened them because they were weakened by the Iraq war, because we were having people having to do uh, maybe eight or ten cycles where they're away from their family, you know, that many times, sometimes for a year at length, and that we were losing uh, some of our most uh, important people. We were losing pilots and other people because they just, you know, had gone through so much and uh, had been away from their families so much that... Uh, that they were leaving the service. And uh, so at that time, we did have problems with our service, but the president and his wife have taken so much time with our military uh, people and invited them to the White House so often and so many other events, and the vice president and his wife, too, have taken such personal interest that I've talked to thousands of people in our military that have uh, really, really been thankful for that kind of appreciation uh, from the president. And, and uh, so it's just the opposite. You know, our budget for the military is equal to the next 20 nations what they spend on the military. So for anybody to say that we've uh, hollowed it out, or for Rubio to say that we have less, less ships and less uh, planes and all the rest, that's just a lie. That's not true. Uh, you know, what they say in these campaigns just is a complete distortion of the facts. I mean, our ships and our Navy is far more sophisticated than it's ever been. And everything is on... Uh, track to go forward as far as, uh, as our new fighters coming out now and, uh, and to uh, redo our uh, tactical and, uh, and uh, nuclear systems uh, in every respect, including our submarines. So there's been no backing down from the American people on the defense budget, no cutting of the budget uh, at all. Uh, that commitment is there and it's solid. I think the difference is that the American people have realized uh, that all these promises about sending American forces to fight on the ground and leaving them there for years doesn't change and can't change uh, some other realities. And you can't build a political system with armed forces, and you can't build a democracy necessarily with, uh, with armed forces, no matter how much you try, no matter how many wonderful people we have uh, uh, that, that actually are engaged in, in nation building. Uh, that it still can't be done uh, simply. And it's a lesson that we, you know, have to remember now and, and take home and to start using our forces wisely. But I think, uh, I think that that's the difference, that we still have our international commitments. The American people are still strong. They still feel very strongly about uh, supporting our, our service people and our veterans and about uh, the military budget and all the rest. They still want to be... Uh, um, as, uh, as up-to-date as possible in every, in every regard, uh, but I think that they want to use uh, more, more common sense uh, in, in engagement and where we get involved with our forces, and I think uh, that's true in the Congress, too, and I think that'll be beneficial to ourselves and the world. Yeah, I think in that regard, actually, there's more frustration really toward Europe, with the exception of... Uh, to some extent, England and France, who have maintained some military capabilities. Uh, but people are naturally worried uh, about our persistent deficits and how we finance this and our social safety net programs going forward and want to have, as we, we try to, we want to have a peaceful world and stability in the world, but that means strong partners. And I think when you point out to them that Japan is paying for a lot of the 
American costs within Japan of our alliance and is working to m modernize and, and, and strengthen its military within the context of a peaceful uh, uh, effort, that that uh, resonates strongly with the American public? Well, thank you. Uh, I've, I have several questions from the floor. So maybe we can go into, it's past six, so we can go into this uh, questions and answer part. Uh, there, there are many questions about Mr. Trump. Uh, Kato-san, I think, who you met yesterday uh, from Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation. Uh, his question is that, is this Trump phenomena a, pr a process of evolution of American democracy or that of a deterioration? How, how do you, it was, this is the first, uh, so you can sort of, I'm gonna read a couple of them so you can uh, pick and choose which, which one to answer. And this question has no name, but uh, is there something in Mr. Trump's message that you can support, understand, or you know, any, any positives in Trump phenomena? So this is the second question. And the third is from uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ida Kaori from NHK. And uh, what are the implications of a Trump presidency to Japan, uh, and the world for that matter, uh, both on the economic front and on the uh, security front? And will Donald Trump, and, and this I guess is a very important question, that would Mr. Trump shift to a more moderate style if he's actually sort of elected as, as uh, the president or a Republican nominee for that matter? So these are the questions that's related to Mr. Trump. So you can sort of pick and choose which, which question uh, you would prefer to answer. Well, I'd, first of all, I'd try to take a quick thing on all three of them. Uh, are we uh, ad, 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 devolving into the pit as a democracy, or has this always been this way? And I think uh, the truth is that uh, we tend to airbrush the past, mm -hmm. and we've had many times of very difficult times in American politics, uh, the culminating, uh, the worst of all, the 20 years leading up to the uh, American Civil War, uh, where people talk about the need for compromise, and on the, at that time, now it's become a bad word in American politics again to some extent, but how can you compromise on an issue, a moral issue like slavery, and is the, this is this people were willing to fight about, and there were also strong regional differences uh, in the United States of an economic nature, and you put it became a, a a very very difficult thing, and talk about collegiality in the Congress. The war broke out really in my mind in the United States Congress when a, someone went from the from the uh, House of Representatives over to the Senate and clubbed someone who had insulted a, a relative of his, and they were both elected almost by unanimity, one from Massachusetts and the other from, uh, uh, I think, South Carolina. So the public, instead of be recoiling in horror when, when people on different sides engaged in, in fisticuffs, we rewarded them by, by uh, re-electing them on e different sides by acclamation. Uh, so this this is the, I think we're nowhere near that stage. People are uh, generally saying we should be behaving in a more civilized way and not on, on necessarily stirring up things that we know uh, are, are divisive in our, in our country. Uh, positive things, uh, well, I, Mr. Trump has said he's strongly in favor of the social security system. Uh, most responsible people feel it's probably going to have to be modernized and reformed, but uh, this is uh, this is a dispute somewhat between the parties. There are a lot of members of the Democratic Party who say, "Don't keep your hands off, don't touch Social Security, it's perfect," and that's Trump's position. Uh, so there, are, uh, 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 that that's something that you could say is 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 something. Uh, and what would Trump do if he's president? Well, we, you know he does not have strong or nuanced 
uh, foreign policy positions on most issues. Uh, the closest one would be the immigration issue, and then expressing more of a kind of a unhappiness, uh, on feeling we've been taken advantage of so somehow, which is sort of dates back to the 1970s and the, Jap the Japanese miracle and everyone saying that J Japan was, t everyone was 10 feet tall and uh, this was going to go on forever. And there was a lot of nervousness about that and more recently toward, toward China. But I would guess, and certainly probably it's just more hope, because I don't know, that uh, he will want any person who is president at the end of the day knows they can't do it all themselves they, they, and that they would want to be a success and he would, he certainly as a business person did call on skilled people to advise him and make partnerships in his various business enterprises and so I suspect that he would end up uh, uh, falling into that pattern and looking for people who were, were knowledgeable and responsible, at least that's my hope. Well, on those three questions, quickly, deter whether it's a deterioration or not, it's clearly a deterioration having somebody like Trump uh, in an election winning primaries. Uh, do I agree with anything that he said? He said he supports our veterans. Well, I do. That's all I can think of that he said that I support out of all these uh, speeches and uh, television time that he's had. And, uh, you know, some people compare it. Would it be more reasonable if he was elected? Some people say, well, you know, Ronald Reagan, that the Democrats really wanted to run against him, and then he won in a landslide in 1980. And, uh, you know, but there's no comparison to uh, Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California and who had a long record of, of involvement and who, who hired excellent people, General Scowcroft and others, you know, in foreign affairs and, uh, you know, hired excellent people uh, uh, to be with him. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's such a difference in, in that regard uh, in every way. I mean, here now we can say, well, Trump, this is his first time in politics and all the rest. Well, now it's been, it's been uh, how many months now? And there are two problems. One is he doesn't have any foreign policy advisors. No, no sufficient people want to sign on and support him. Nor does he, uh, even with all of his money and, and all the rest, uh, look up any facts or have them do some fact-checking about these speeches that he gives every day where he spouts off about lies and distortions about basic things, like how much is spent on uh, defense or, you know, any uh, treaty or any, how much he keeps saying the president uh, in the deal with Iran gave them $150 billion. Well, of course we didn't give them $150 billion. But he says that, you know, three times a week. You know, it's just an outright lie. So there's a problem of credibility there. And even though I would differ with President Reagan, I wouldn't say that he was a dishonest person distorting all the facts. He might just have a different perception of me and a different take on the issues uh, in, in very important areas, but not, uh, not this kind of blatant lying all the time. And, uh, you know, you look at uh, candidates, who they surround themselves with, who are their advisors, what's their past record, uh, you know, what things have they done before in their lives uh, uh, that show what they might do as an incumbent. So, yeah, it, it, does, it, does, uh, it does frighten me. And, and, you know, that's why I think uh, that it's so important that he be defeated. Uh, in the election, and that's why I think that the American people uh, will, and that he doesn't have a majority now, and that he won't have a majority later. Well, uh, I was in China last week, and I, we had a sort of dialogue with the Chinese-American experts, how they saw the situation in, in, in your country. And they said that Americans are overreacting. Your history is all about polarization and civil conflict. Uh, Constitution, independence, civil war, Andrew Jackson, New Deal, labor unrest in the late 1990s, new, uh, 80s, uh, the New Deal, the 60s revolt, and all that. So these crises of the republic was there all along. So you know, they were proud that they see things in terms of history, whereas the Americans don't. So they were, they were saying that Americans were over are overreacting. That was a kind of interesting perspective from a Chinese American expert. And uh, my my one of my students asked me, "Do you you know do you see anything positive in Mr. Trump?" And try to come out with at least one. That was the question that I got from my my student. And I said that at least sort of Mr. Trump and his supporters are saying that most important things in life. I'm not going to let anyone touch it. 
um, you know, it's the do-it-yourself sort of uh, mentality. And I think that's a pure form of American democracy. And until he went into these sort of race hatred and violent things and all that, I sort of saw something positive. Not, you know, it was a difficult argument to make. But you at least could have made that kind of argument. But now I think it's becoming more and more difficult to sort of give a sort of positive twist to uh, what uh, Mr. Trump is doing. So that, that's uh, sort of my comment. And there were several sort of questions related to TPP. Uh, and you know, the TPP is not a popular issue now among the candidates. Uh, no one's supporting TPP, right? At least straightforwardly. So how do you see the uh, uh, sort of the, the, you know, the issues on TPP turning out? Would the President of Congress would be able to sort of uh, finish the job, or it's a dead issue? How should we look at it? And how, how do you two see uh, or support a, a Trans-Pacific Partnership? I support it, and, but I would say uh, that uh, even in Japan politics, politicians have changed their positions on TPP before and after elections. Uh, I think that in the, uh, my impression is that People have not given up on it in the United States and that they are busy talking to members of both parties and both the House and Senate uh, and, and seeing if after the election uh, it will be possible to have the votes to uh, uh, ratify the treaty. I don't th think that they know for sure whether it's possible, but they think it's more possible, obviously, bef after the election than it after is. After the election and under President Obama's term. Their whole, a lame duck, duck mm -hmm. session. There will be a number of representatives who will not be up for election, who, who, uh, but who will still be able to vote because their successors will not have taken place. And uh, they expect quite a few of them uh, to support it because people who look at it, leaving aside the emotion and the frustration of it, think that it's, uh, most people I've talked to who are economists and business people and agricultural people in my district and others feel that it's, a, it's an important uh, thing. And then of course, people who are worrying about the stability and the sort of the political, the, the military geopolitical aspects of it think that this is a, a piece of building a stable uh, uh, region. I think uh, normally I would agree with Tom that they'd try to do it in a lame duck session, but I think it's dead for this uh, uh, for this year, and I and I think it'll have to be renegotiated, and and I think Professor, it's what you said before that it's both political parties that are raising issues about uh, trade, and I think Congress is going to have much more scrutiny on trade agreements, and, uh, and I think there will be some change in direction, and I think a lot of it is uh, from uh, the uh, vote that Bernie Sanders has been getting. And, uh, and we've already seen uh, Hillary Clinton say that uh, she's going to take a different stand uh, on trade in some regard. So I think overall that we're going to see uh, uh, a, new, uh, a new take on trade uh, treaties. But I, but I think there'll be some new opportunities. I really do. I think, and I think it's time that we evolve and have some new ideas. I think that uh, uh, it's an example of what has to change. And it's, I think it'll benefit more people and more nations, actually, with a new approach. Well, we, we, when we focus too much on the election, we forget that this is the last year of President Obama's presidency. Uh, 2008 was a very historic moment for, I think, the United States. And looking back, well, his term is not finished yet. He has a year left. But looking back, what was his accomplishment? In historical context, what does his presidency mean? It's a big question, but uh, if you have some thoughts about it. Uh, we would like to hear it. Well, I, 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 the, I mentioned it earlier or alluded to the fact that I think a lot of Americans in both parties uh, were happy when he was elected, be, uh, not because they agreed with a particular position, but they felt he was an able person and that part of the American dream is to be able to tell everyone, every person's son or daughter that they can be president of the United States someday. And, that, and, and, and this is a continuation of the whole uh, 
abolitionists of slavery movement on to uh, uh, various other reform movements in our society, and, and it's a good thing. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think it's much too soon to, it'll take 10 or 20 years to, to be able to evaluate some of the things that he's done. Uh, it's uh, often the case that when we get a president who's a great success after, say, a four, four one year, four, one term, four year president, that he is getting a lot of the credit for something that that president lost an election, re-election on, but he did was, a, Carter is an example, did a lot of reforms that then became Reagan reforms. And I think uh, the first Bush did a number of reforms that laid the groundwork for what became the, the Clinton economy and the success of the Clinton administration. So I hope if, if, the, if the four or eight years after the Obama administration are good, prosperous, uh, exciting years, uh, then his presidency will, will end up doing very well. One thing that happened while he was president but it's hard to tell whether he actually, and he, I think, would deny he was responsible for it right now, was the revival of the American energy, domestic energy industry. We, we reestablished, which is hugely important, energy independence. Now the price of uh, energy has plummeted on the world market. Uh, this happened while he was president. Whether it was any of his responsibility, or, or not, I, I can't tell. Uh, it, it certainly is something the federal government did a lot of effort in doing research, people in the oil industry did, and, and developing this, all this fracking and new types of uh, natural gas. Something we've been trying to do from the last energy uh, crisis when Carter was president, trying to turn the Rocky Mountains in, into natural gas, and that didn't work, but this new fracking business has uh, worked miraculously well, and it uh, means that there are relatively infinite amount of uh, energy that, that creates other problems, but that's been a great success during his presidency. Well, I was telling some of our guests the other night that, you know, when I was 12 years old, uh, uh, I saw the president speak on the day that he announced his formal campaign in Detroit, and I was able to touch his, uh, touch his hand, and that uh, I told o President Obama that uh, after uh, his, uh, one of his second State of the Union speech, and I told him what a great speech it was, and I told him the truth, that I had not slept as well with any president uh, uh, trusting their judgment since John Kennedy until President Obama. When I was a kid, I used to, I worked in his campaign and then I, I uh, ran home to hear his press conferences uh, with John Kennedy, you know, as a boy and, uh, and I do that now as an adult for President Obama, you know, because I, I trust his judgment. Not that everything is perfect, not that uh, he always makes the right decision, but he does it for the right reasons in every case. And I think what he's done overall is bring sanity to our system. His one, his one mistake, as he said, his biggest mistake is he has not communicated enough with the American people. He's not the kind of person to pat himself on the back. He's not a per the kind of person to brag about what he's done. But you know, we had the, the collapse of our financial world when he took over and, uh, and uh, the failure of a war in Iraq. And he has brought back our military service. He has brought back uh, our uh, employment, uh, our uh, f financial system uh, in all regards, and I think he's brought back great faith in America that people now can criticize and forget how bad it was just eight years ago, you know, and, and, uh, and he doesn't stand around saying, well, give me the credit for this or that and, and doing that on a regular basis. What he has really restored, though, after, after uh, a period of uh, the last uh, president, um, he's restored the ideals of America and what America stands for. That's what we're in danger of losing. That's why this election is so important now, and I think why so many people here and in our country are outraged about Mr. Trump. We don't want to lose those ideals of what America stands for. You know, we hear people on the right say that it's, you know, such a unique nation and, and special nation and all the rest. Well, it only is because of the ideals of our nation and what we've done in the past. Uh, and, and a lot of that is working and helping with other people. And, uh, and I think that uh, what President Obama has done is, again, work with other nations and let all the peoples of the world know that we still have uh, the, the strong ideals that uh, have been America's great, great strength and responsibility all these years. Well, Congressman Hartel's sort of comments reminds me of, uh, you know, the David Brooks, the conservative columnist of New York Times, that at least 
President Obama is a decent man and we will miss him. So if you compare to the candidates that we're seeing now, I mean, we... I have to say, I don't think we're going to appreciate him until he's gone. And I think we're going to look back at it next year and say, well, you know, what class, uh, what a great family man, what a great patriot, uh, what a modest man uh, we had as president, and what a smart man we had as president. I think that's how we're going to feel next year. Uh, but I appreciate that right now, you can tell. Well, both you served uh, in the 80s, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Congressman uh, Petra uh, sort of served long after that. But in the 80s, you know, there, there's, we, we know about the relationship between President Reagan and Tip O'Neill, that although there were partisan differences, they were able to talk. And I guess we see no more of that in, on the Hill in the U.S. Congress. Why did it turn out to be like this? This deep partisan difference where you, you can no longer talk with your colleagues. And it's so different from the days that you served in, in Congress. And how do you think you can, you, you, the U.S. can fix this? Well, a lot of the tone is set by the president. There are a lot of other factors as well. But uh, uh, President Obama was only in the Senate for t two years. Uh, and uh, he didn't know that many people in Washington. Uh, he didn't get to know a few of the other senators. Reagan uh, had not been in Washington, was a governor though and national candidate. And after he became president, uh, a, a friend of mine who was a speechwriter for Senator Kennedy uh, told me the most remarkable thing happened. The Irish politicians, a lot of Irish do well in politics in the United States, it's, and, and the president was Irish, Tip O'Neill was Irish, Kennedy, a lot of, a lot of them would get together on St. Patrick's Day at a club in Washington for lunch to just celebrate. And Kennedy didn't come back to his office when he said he was going to come back. Finally, he came back late. And he said, and they called his staff in and said, the most remarkable thing happened to me. We had this lunch, it was very nice, and as I was getting ready to go, uh, President Reagan came over to me and uh, said, you know, I'm new in town, uh, we, don't, uh, we really don't know each other that well, uh, are you, do, you, do you have a few minutes to stop and have another drink and we'll just shoot the breeze? And so they sat around talking for a couple hours. Uh, Reagan would invite uh, uh, Tip O'Neill and his wife, they, who was up in Boston, when she was coming down to, over Millie to uh, the White House for dinner. They would argue, but he, he was very nice. Uh, there had been very little uh, congr I mean, I used to know from re re back to Jimmy Carter, the Reagan people, so the congressional liaison always working to help make congressmen look good from either party on pr issues in your district. The, the current administration has done very little of that. And, and people in both parties privately c complain a lot about it. And uh, uh, there are other factors, the way the media, uh, things didn't used to be televised on the floor of the bodies. So it's a lot of things. What, what's con communicated is the disagreement and the dissension and so on. Uh, the day-to-day -day work of the Congress is in the committees and the subcommittees. Uh, people generally work very well. They're on the defense committee or I was on the public works and, and on the education committees. You're there because you're interested in the subject and you want to get something done so you can go back to your voters and say re-elect me because we accomplished something so you understand the issues a little better and you work across party lines to where you if you disagree you can't get anything done but you find areas where you can agree and then uh, do it and and that still goes on but it's not perceived that way as much because of the way the media uh, works and it's like Mr. Trump now saying all my rallies are peaceful. Well, I'm sure 99% of them are peaceful, but you get every three or four of them uh, for, for a minute or two, there's someone, uh, slugs someone, or there's something or another. So it's, a, it, it's, it's the thing that, it, it, the perception is that it's all a riot, whereas the truth is that 95% or 99% of it is just ordinary politics, basically, and, and, the, and certainly in the Congress, people still get along together 
uh, quite well on a personal basis. Anyone who's elected representing 700,000 people, uh, I was told when I first got there, if, even if you can't find it right away, there's some redeeming value in that person because otherwise they wouldn't have been elected or re-elected uh, by, by their voters. And, uh, so so uh, get to know them and you'll, you may, may appreciate their, their uh, strange virtues after a while. And you do learn from people you disagree with and that's an important part of the whole process. I, I think I would agree with Tom that in the past, you know, that was the relationship and, and Tip O'Neill as Speaker uh, loved uh, Jerry Ford, the minority leader who became president. And uh, he would talk about that, you know. So, the, uh, but that's the kind of person he was. Instead, the president is inaugurated, takes the oath, and the Republican majority leader of the Senate says that his job, his number one job, is to make sure the president fails. That's his number one job, to make sure the president of the United States fails. Uh, you know, we have people, because things have changed in Washington, you know. Uh, the good part is that some people go beyond that, and they still... Uh, have relationships. Uh, Speaker Boehner had a good relationship with Nancy Pelosi, so I'm glad to report when there is a good relationship of communication and, uh, and, and they trusted and, and valued each other as individuals. You know, that was important for our country. When you have somebody like the Republican uh, Senate leader say that he wants the president to fail, uh, then you're not going to have any communication. And when you have the right wing distort uh, issues, when you say that you're not going to consider, even though the Constitution gives the power of the president to appoint, you're not going to consider his nominee for the Supreme Court. It's one thing to question that nominee and to have hearings and maybe to vote against that nominee uh, and maybe not even have the time to complete the process, but to say that you're not even going to meet the nominee when the President of the United States under the Constitution has the power, you know. You can distort the Constitution. Ironically, it's some of the right-wing people who say they believe in the Constitution first and they want to do what the Founding Fathers say and did. Well, there wouldn't be a United States of America if the Founding Fathers hadn't reached a, a tremendous compromise. You know, 13 different colonies of different sizes, tiny like Rhode Island and Delaware, huge like Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania. How could you put that together? Well, they finally have what they call the Connecticut Compromise. And that is that the Senate will be two senators, no matter how big and small the state and population and area, and the House of Representatives will be by population. Well, that was called the compromise, and that created our nation. And so when people say that they will not compromise, that that's a dirty word on uh, the Republican right, then they don't know the history of our country. They don't know what the Founding Fathers did. Our country is very diverse, and we face many, many challenges. And, you know, the other side, uh, the opposition, is the opposition. They're the adversary. They are not the enemy. They are Americans. And they believe strongly in their country and, they, and, uh, and their ideas and what they want to carry forward in their policies. They're not somebody to be mistrusted because they disagree with me. You know, that's the kind of politics we have in Washington. That's got to change. And I hope in the process of that election uh, that we're having now that it does change. Well, uh, I'm afraid we running out of time. And I thank uh, the both congressmen for uh, their wisdom, experience, and insight. Uh, we'll be following the election uh, closely and hope the uh, American political system would uh, achieve the, uh, the right results. Well,